Greetings. It gives me great joy to welcome you to this March 2021 conference of the Schiller Institute and the International Caucus of Labor Committees, the world at a crossroad two months into the new U.S. administration. I'm Jason Ross, your host for this panel, a science advisor to the Schiller Institute and a member of the board of directors of the LaRouche Organization. This weekend's conference occurs at a truly tumultuous time in the world, and just after a meeting among representatives of the United States and China, two countries whose bilateral relationship is perhaps the most important in shaping the world. Will unnecessary, counterproductive conflict that is not in the self-interest of either country be allowed to gain the upper hand? Or will a new paradigm of relations among nations and people take hold, offering the prospects of peace through development? And why is this conflict developing? If the entire world were to submit to the unscientific or anti-scientific outlook of the Green New Deal and the dictatorial Great Reset, would conflict be necessary to hold mankind back? Or would poverty and gnawing hunger do the trick? Citizens of all nations of the world must address themselves to these questions and others, and all can play a role in determining the outcome of the present crisis. This conference is composed of four panels, and each will offer at least one discussion period where viewers, like you, can participate in the discussion. To do that, please send your questions, your thoughts, your input to us at questions at schillerinstitute.org, an address that we'll repeat during the show. This three-hour panel, called Reversing the Cultural Wasteland, the Urgency of a New Renaissance, Creating a Planetary Culture Worthy of the Dignity of Humanity, will be keynoted by the founder of the Schiller Institute, Helga Zepp LaRouche. Now, to set the stage for the quality of thought suited to tackle the complex problems we will discuss over this weekend, we will begin with a musical selection. This is the fourth movement of Beethoven's Violin Sonata, Opus 96, performed at a September 9, 1987 concert in honor of Lyndon LaRouche's 65th birthday. It is performed at the Cousanus House in Berncastel Cous, and we may hear more later about the importance of Nicholas of Cousa in creating the Renaissance. The performers are Norbert Breinin on violin and Carlo Levi Minzi on the piano. After this musical performance, I will introduce our keynote speaker, Schiller Institute founder Helga Zepp LaRouche. Thank you. 
If you're just joining us, that was violinist Norbert Brynin and pianist Carlo Levi Mincy in a performance in honor of the 65th birthday of Lyndon LaRouche. So we will now turn to our keynote speaker, Helga Tsepp LaRouche. She founded the Schiller Institute, the International Schiller Institute, just shy of 40 years ago, and she has been a tireless advocate of creating a civilization worthy of the dignity of the human individual through her ceaseless organizing with her husband of many decades, Lyndon LaRouche, freed from unjust imprisonment by her labors. Helga brought the concept of the World Land Bridge to China, where she is affectionately known as the Silk Road Lady, and she speaks to us today on the topic, Will Human History End in a Tragedy or Continue with a New Paradigm? Helga Tsepp LaRouche. Hello. I greet you all over the world, wherever you may be sitting right now. It is a pleasure for me to speak to you. Now, when we choose the title of the conference, World at a Crossroad, two months into the Biden administration, we did anticipate turmoil. Still, it is eerie how prescient those words were. For an acting president of the United States to call the president of Russia a killer, as President Biden did in an ABC TV program, for sure breaks a taboo. It was a trick question by Stepanopoulos, but it worked. Naturally, that shows you where so-called journalism has gone these days. Fortunately, President Putin proved to be of good humor by inviting Biden to have a live internet debate, maybe on Friday, which was yesterday or Monday, since over the weekend he, Putin, wanted to go to the tiger and otherwise he wished him good health. Nevertheless, if the president of the most powerful country, which has 5,800 5, nuclear warheads, says such a thing about the president of Russia, which has 6,375 nuclear warheads, these are figures from January 2020, it demonstrates the danger we are in. If one considers the avalanche of recent statements and military doctrines more and more defining Russia and China as strategic rival, adversary, enemy, it looks like we are in act four or five of a global tragedy quickly approaching what Schiller called the punctum salience, the point in the drama where all previous developments come together in one moment of decision, where it depends on the character and vision of the leading actors on stage, on whose action it depends, if we can find a solution on a higher level, if we can access a new paradigm on a higher plane of thinking and escape the tragic outcome, or if they act out the logic of flawed axioms and the drama ends as a tragedy. This time, however, it is not on a stage, it is our history, our lives. Linda LaRouche, in a beautiful article published in EIR November 9, 2007, called The Force of Tragedy, said an amazing thing, which pertains to the reason why we decided that this time the first panel should be devoted to the need for a class classical renaissance, because it is the greatest classical artistic production that through those one can access the level of thinking required to deal with this crisis and not put the cultural panel at the end of the conference as we usually do. LaRouche pointed out that since Vladimir Vernadsky and Albert Einstein, one knows about the partition of the universe in rigorously defined phase spaces, the non-biotic, the biosphere, the noosphere, but that there is a fourth general phase space which combines the level of classical tragedy, physical science, classical artistic composition, and the subject of statecraft as known by Aeschylus, Plato, Shakespeare, Lessing, Schiller, into a single subject matter. That fourth phase space is the true substance of history, Lyndon LaRouche said. 
If mankind wants to find a solution to the present many existential crises, political leaders on all levels of society have to access the thinking of that fourth phase space. The Russian reaction to the Biden remarks show that they see that we are at such a punctum salience. Konstantin Kozakhov, deputy speaker of the Russian Federation Council, called it a fault line. Quote, these boorish remarks kill off all expectations that a new administration will pursue a new policy towards Russia, he said. And in real anger, he said, these remarks are coming from a president of a country that drops a bomb somewhere in the world every 12 minutes. As a result of that, there were the deaths of more than 500,000 people linked to US actions since 2001. Could you comment on that, Mr. Biden? <clears throat> it is horrifying how these crises have been building up over the last several years, with as good as no awareness of the general public, no public discourse, no debate among intellectuals, let alone in the parliaments. Step by step towards the abyss. In the realm of military doctrines, there was a major shift towards confrontation with Russia and China, starting with the December 2017 publication of the US national strategy, which defined for the first time Russia and China as geopolitical rivals. This was continued by the national defense strategy in January 2018, followed by the nuclear posture review and the creation of a US space command and the US space force, whose aim is American dominance in space to prevent China from defining the new rules in space. In March 2021, the White House published the Interim National Security Strategic Guidance. The 24 page long document states the intent to align the world democracies against the quote malign influences of Russia and China, re-establish a rules-based order in the world, essentially globalize NATO with a clear focus on forming alliances in the Indo-Pacific against Russia and China, and swiftly move back into a position of international leadership in the global climate change agenda, lower global carbon emission, and ensure that the US, not China, is setting the rules. All of this is supposed to be uh, an out to outcompete a more assertive and authoritarian China, quote, prevail in the strategic composition with China or any other nation. Quote, climate climate will be elevated as a national security priority. We will incorporate climate, <coughs> uh, climate, um, <coughs> climate risk assessment into our wargaming, modeling and simulation, and we will bolster mission resilience and deploy solutions that optimize capability and reduce our, our, uh, about our own carbon footprint. Isn't this very strange, the fight against climate change, a national security priority? But while these official documents at least formally remain in the realm of professional military language, that pretense does no longer exist in such papers as the paper, The Longer Telegram, published on January 28th this year by the Atlantic Council written by an anonymous former member of government with, quote, deep knowledge about China and supposedly one of the most important papers ever published by the council. The title is a conscious reference to the long telegram by George Kennan from 1946, which had called for the containment of, uh, of the Soviet Union uh, this document calls presently for an insider coup against President Xi Jinping by disaffected leading members of the CPC who are willing, however, to give up the idea to pursue a Chinese model of development and submit to the dominance of the world by the US. And who are the main funders of this think tank? Some of the top US weapon makers like Ray Theon, General Atomics, 
Boeing, Lockheed, Martin, Northrop, Grumman, and NATO. Of the same nature is the Brit British intelligence directed Navalny operation, which has essentially the same aim to catalyze a regime change operation against President Putin. Now, before it comes to World War III, because that is where this build up is heading towards, uh, let's reflect of what is actually happening here. Didn't we hear only a short time ago after the collapse of the Soviet Union that we had reached the end of history, which was one of the most idiotic things ever said, that from that point in time, Western democracies would take over the world and all would agree to a system of Western values, neoliberal economies, gender politics, deconstructionism in art, etc., etc. A quick review is useful here because there are lessons that must be learned if tragedy is to be avoided. There is actually a rivalry of two competing systems, two completely different conceptions of the world, men's role in it, and an associated vision of the future of mankind. In 1968, when Deng Xiaoping initiated the reform and opening up policy following the deep valley of the Cultural Revolution, China was one of the poorest countries on earth. By applying the best aspects of the tradition of physical economy as it originated with Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and developed further by Hamilton, Liszt, Carey and Witte, he set China on a course of continuous innovation which in the 40 years since it since catapulted 850 million Chinese out of in large part extreme poverty, which for any unprejudiced mind is one of the, if not the most outstanding cultural historic achievements in universal history. Achieved, uh, he, they achieved the goal to eliminate extreme poverty in all of China before the end of 2020 while in the United States and Europe, you had the opposite trend that po poverty increased. In 1991, we expanded the proposal of the productive triangle, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, which was the answer of Lyndon LaRouche, my late husband, to the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 to become the Eurasian land bridge, modeled on the ancient Silk Road, a system of development corridors to connect the population and industrial centers of Europe with those of Asia as a way <clears throat> to industrialize all the landlocked areas of the Eurasian continent. That idea was an obvious thought for anyone who came out of the philosophical tradition of Nikolaus of Kuz, Kuzansky, Vernadsky, Kraft Erike, namely the idea that life developed with the help of photosynthesis out of the oceans that organisms would develop with higher energy flux, flux density metabolisms, and that eventually a species would develop whose creative reason would establish a whole new category of existence in the universe, human beings. The natural cause of evolution of that new species would be to settle at the oceans and rivers and through infrastructure development move inlands. Up and development of the landlocked areas of our continent through these development corridors was sort of an obvious idea uh, that when the Iron Curtain disintegrated, after the infrastructural development of all continents on the planet were completed, the next phase of this development would be <clears throat> the building of infrastructure in nearby space, colonies on Moon and Mars as stepping stones for mankind to become a galactic species. I warned in many species in uh, speeches in 1990, in the 1990s, that if one would make the mistake to see, superimpose unrestrained free market economy on the collapsed communist economy, maybe one could continue the casino economy for a while, but then soon it would come to an even greater collapse <clears throat> of the entire system. If the productive triangle and the Eurasian land bridge would have been implemented, there was great support for it at the time, it would have been the perfect peace plan for the 21st century, but it was rejected by the West for geopolitical reasons. 
Instead, the idea was in the United States and Great Britain, France at that time in particular, to turn the former superpower Soviet Union into a raw material producing third world country. Jeffrey Sachs's shock therapy of the Yeltsin period actually <clears throat> uh, had a population reduction of about one million per year. So it was complete genocide. In the United States by 1992, uh, the policy of PNAC, the project of a new American century doctrine, uh, established the idea of Dick Cheney that the United States would remain the only superpower and never admit any rival on the strategic level. In June 1992, uh, the equivalent uh, policy was uh, proposed at the Earth Summit in Rio, which was the <clears throat> beginning of a gigantic global offensive of Methusian policy, reaffirming the previous policy of the Club of Rome and their idea of limits to growth, uh, which was published in 1972, and which at the time was countered with a very powerful book by Lyndon LaRouche, There Are No Limits to Growth. Lyndon LaRouche, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the Rio summit also was the reaffirmation of Henry Kissinger's NSSM 200 doctrine of 74, which is an incredibly scandalous document, which demanded population reduction and the idea of using food, the food weapon as a means of population control. The arguments of this claim of Methusian dominance over an unipolar world would change often. It went from <clears throat> limited resources to the ozone hole is increasing, to sour rain, to dying forests, to nuclear energy equals fascism, and now in the recent period, climate change. But the real issue was always the oligarchical imperial order run by a small oligarchical elite and population control. This same year, in 1992, this is only 14 years after Deng's reform policy went into effect, China already had experienced some progress, but it was mostly in the coastal re uh, region. Uh, in the rest of the country, there was still vast poverty. I participated in a conference in 96 in Beijing, which we had proposed to the Chinese government two years earlier, uh, which had the title, The Development of the Regions Along the Eurasian Land Bridge. And it defined the strategic long-term perspective for China until 2010. This policy, however, was interrupted by the Asia crisis of 97. In 2001, China was invited to participate in the WTO with the expectation that the integration into the world market would lead to China adopting Western values, Western democracy, and so forth. Except the Washington Consensus, the rule, rules-based order of the casino economy of Wall Street and the city of London. But instead of acknowledging the end of history, China rejuvenated the tradi its tradition of 5,000 years of Chinese history and culture. And in 2013, Xi Jinping announced in Kazakhstan the policy of the new Silk Road, which in the seven and a half years since has become the biggest infrastructure program in history. 150 countries are collaborating with it. And as the comedian Bill Maher in a short video uh, stated not to acknowledge that means you are a silly people uh, because China was able to build 40,000 kilometer fast train system, 500 completely new cities for millions of people, the most advanced fusion research, the mission to the far side moon and now to Mars. And as Xi Jinping recently said, China today is closer to the goal of great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation than at any time in history and <clears throat> to become a world-class power in science and technology. Putin uh, only become, be, became demonized after, uh, <clears throat> as, 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 demon, as he is portrayed by the Atlanticist establishment, after he 
started to reverse the development of the Yeltsin period and reassert the status of Russia being a world and not a regional power, as Obama had disrespectfully insisted when he resumed the office of the president again. So where is all of this going to end? If the Biden administration, global Britain, NATO and the EU insist on containing Russia and China, whose strategic partnership is strengthening in face of the aggressive policies coming from the Western alliance, will it inevitably come to World War III, which nobody could survive? Xi Jinping, during a trip to Seattle in 2015, made the point, there is no such thing as the so-called Thucydides trap in the world. But should major countries time and time again make the mistake of strategic miscalculation, they may, might create such a trap for themselves. The Chinese ambassador to the United States, Sui Tiankai, referred several times to an article of the historian Professor Graham Ellison, who had asked the question, if the US and China were about to end up exactly in this conflict, uh, the way the Greek historian Thucydides had described, and go to war. Thucydides, who lived from 460 to 404 BC, conveyed to us how the beautiful Greece, uh, classical Greece went down because of the competition between Sparta and Athens, which led to the Peloponnesian War. Following the, uh, the Persian Wars from 500 to 479 BC, and then again 470 to 448 BC, in which Athens had proven to be victorious over the Persians, it emerged as a kind of a political superpower, which angered the oligarchically ruled Sparta, which had been the dominant power before and which tried to portray uh, <clears throat> To, to stay in power by entering various alliances. After the final victory by Athens over the Persians and the so-called Peace of Callias, it could have actually dissolved the Attic League, but under the influence of the Sophists in Athens, it transformed into an Attic Empire and transformed the previous voluntary allies into payers of tribute and vessels. Most famous and informative for our present situation today is the story how Athens forced the inhabitants of the island of Milos uh, into the new arrangement, which Thucydides describes in Book 5, in the dialogue between the envoy of Athens and the representative of Milos. The Athenian remarks that with the victory over the Persians, Athens would have acquired the right to rule, and the mighty does not uh, does what he likes, and the weak, the weak one has to obey. The representative from Milos argues that if Athens already does not respect the law, it should consider that others could take its hardness as an example if it ever would be defeated him, itself. The Athenians answers the Milosians should submit uh, under the rule of the Athenians, since that would be to the benefit of both sides. The representative of Milos asks, astounded, how slavery could be as beneficial as the dominance to which the Athenian answers, it would be preferable to become an underling rather than to be killed. <clears throat> and for them, it would be a gain if they didn't have to kill them. To the question, if they could not stay neutral, the Athenians answer, answers no, since their enmity would damage Athens less than their friendship, which could be read as a sign of weakness on their part. In any case, the whole world, uh, in the whole world, the principle of the powerful would apply. The Milosians <clears throat> argue uh, that, he, that they could not give up their independence, which they had since, since 700 years, but would wish to remain neutral. Shortly afterwards, <clears throat> Athens started the hostilities and the people of Milos had to surrender unconditionality and the Athenians killed all men and sold the women and children into slavery. Thucydides describes then further how the Athenians' exorbitance 
is luring them into ever more offensive behavior. And finally, the Sicilian expedition from 415 to 413 BC, in which they suffer a crushing defeat from which they never discover. So maybe one should think about this story uh, when Mr. Blinken demands from Germany to give up Nord Stream 2. So in the age of thermonuclear weapons, one should think twice if one creates a Thucydides trap uh, where there has to be none. The most important conflict comes from the total opposite of the trajectory of development of these two systems. While China and in principle the countries which are collaborating with it in the BRI are putting the maximum emphasis on innovation, on the living standards of their people, on fostering the creativity of the population as the source of innovation. The trajectory of the Malthusian faction on the other side goes to go is to go backward in history to lower energy flux densities, uh, lower consumption, have fewer people. The coordinated push among the central bankers since the infamous meeting in Jackson Hole, Wyoming in August 2019 is to go for a regime change, the Great Reset, the decarbonization of the world economy, shifting the trillions, as a paper by the EU and the German government put it, to direct all investments into green technologies, which will mean a dramatic reduction in the living standards of the populations of US and Europe, an increase of poverty worldwide, and in light of the already ravaging pandemic and world famine, a massive reduction of the population in the so-called developing sector. In other words, genocide. Eskilos represents this conflict in his trilogy, Prometheus Bound, where the conflict between Zeus, the Olympian god, as the incarnation of the oligarchical system, and Prometheus, whom he punishes for having brought fire and therefore progress and productivity to man. What we are dealing with, uh, and that is at the bottom of these two direct opposite trajectories of development, is the image of man. The Promethean image sees each human being as an enormous enrichment to humanity as a whole, since each individual has the potential to make fundamental discoveries in natural science, in the composition of great classical art, and one creative person who makes a discovery of a universal physical principle can create an entirely new platform which can redefine the entire mode of production of humanity on a qualitatively higher level of productivity, such as the steam engine, antibiotics, nuclear power, lasers, and similar discoveries. The Malthusian conception of man sees each person as a parasite, a burden to mother nature, a carbon emitting burden contributing to global warming, and therefore the fewer such nuisances there are, the better. Naturally, the whole Malthusian argument is a scientific fraud, as <clears throat> the computer program on which the limits to growth so-called study was based on was a rigged program where <clears throat> the uh, end, the uh, desired outcome was determined first, and then the program was programmed accordingly. The authors, Meadows and Foresters, admitted later that they had left out the role of scientific and technological progress in defining what a resource is. The Malthusian argument is an outright lie by the oligarchy, amplified by the political correctness spread by the mainstream media controlled by Wall Street and the city of London, and most recently the social media of the IT giants of Silicon Valley, foundations and think tanks reflecting the interest of the financial sector. The artificially induced paradigm shift, not initiated, but PR propagandized with millions of dollars in many languages, uh, set into motion by the Club of Rome on behalf of the international oligarchy has been very effective. The greenization of the minds of millions of people with the lack of scientific rigor makes them susceptible, susceptible for all kinds of lies including those about Russia and China. 
Larouche writes in The Force of Tragedy here in the suppression of the scientific and related creative powers of region, reason uh, <clears throat> lies uh, in the minds of the mass, mass of population lies the essence of the principal force of tragedy. It is that invisible uh, but not nonetheless efficient force of tragedy Larouche talks about which bends the will of men and women into avoiding the feared displeasure of the powerful, satanic figure of the fictitious Zeus, which has to be uh, addressed and changed. Now, little LaRouche <coughs> uh, <coughs> basically uh, made the point that uh, today's uh, tra tragedy is based on the total lack of a scientifically and rigor rigorous understanding of the population, but that the notion of tragedy must be a subject of a strategic intelligence, intelligence assessment, which must be, uh, must be studied by any serious viewer of the present US situation. So let's start with a sober assessment of the situation. It is very clear that the policies of the neoliberal economic and cultural system have completely failed. If you look at the pandemic, why is it that all the Asian cultures have done so much better, fewer deaths, quick return to normal economic life? Because they are based on a value system which puts the common good up front as compared to the neoliberal idea of a individualistic liberty where everything is allowed. Look at the famine, the absolutely unbelievable humanitarian crisis in Yemen, in Syria, in many African and Latin American countries. Hunger of biblical dimension is the result of these neoliberal policies of the West. Uh, the, the, uh, why did the West not uh, start a, a so-called vaccine diplomacy of which they accuse Russia and China? Why did they not develop uh, <clears throat> the developing countries? Pope Paul, John Paul II, uh, the in 1990, when he was asked if the collapse of the Soviet Union would prove that the Western system is morally superior, he answered, absolutely not, because they are characterized by the structures of sin. Uh, look at the third world, he said, and then you see the reason why I'm saying this. Now, the failure of the West is the result of a deep cultural crisis, uh, which can only be compared to the decadence of the end phase of the Roman Empire. Look at our popular culture, the entertainment, uh, which ranges from satanic to perverse, or the mind-deadening banality of most of what people regard as free uh, entertainment. We have seen an erosion almost an, an amnesia of the cultural memory of our great tradition. For the vast majority of the youth, they have no idea about classical culture. They think that the Rolling Stones are classic. <clears throat> the contemporaries don't even know what they have forgotten. Now, in order to remedy this, let's take a look at the universal history uh, in the way Schiller described it in his famous speech in Jena in 1789. He said, look, it took only a few thousand years for man to develop from an asocial troglodyte to the high classical art, to a Dante, to Shakespeare, Bach, Beethoven, or Schiller. This has to do with the absolute difference between human beings and all other forms of life and the proof of this is the willful, the ability for willful increase of the relative potential population density, which in a few thousand years, uh, maybe 10,000 or 20,000 years altogether, enabled mankind to increase its population density from a few million to uh, almost 8 billion uh, people today. As Lyndon LaRouche has amplified, uh, uh, emphasized many times, no higher ape, no domesticate, domesticated pet, no dog uh, has been ever able to imitate uh, that creative ability of human beings. They may be able to imitate aspects of human behavior, 
but they never have discovered a physical principle. And that is the absolute fundamental difference between the biosphere and the noosphere. If one studies all the cradles of human culture as they developed <clears throat> the origins of the Chinese, Indian, Mesopotamian, Egyptian and Greek culture, the Confucian, how the Confucian philosophy laid the basis for the following 2,500 years of Chinese history. Look at the wisdom of the Vedic writings, the library of Alexandria, classical Greece, the Gupta period in India, the collaboration of Harun al-Rashid with Charlemagne leading to the Carolingian Renaissance, which enabled Europe to rediscover its treasures from the past. The Song Dynasty, Frederick Hohenstaufen's collaboration with the Arab world, the Andalusian Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance, the emergence of the sovereign nation state through Cusanus and Louis XI in France, Shakespeare, the development of classical music from Bach, Beethoven to Brahms, Shelley, Keats, Lessing, Schiller, El Edgar Allan Poe. All these cultures contributed to the human progress and it is the totality and continuity of that great work of art, science, poetry, music and architecture, painting and statecraft, which is the force face space uh, in our universe. It is through universal history, which sets aside us as a human species and which <clears throat> a great many great minds have contributed, which makes mankind immortal. There has been in history often a debate if animals have souls and any owner of a pet will insist that these animals do have soul. But I agree with Ibn Sina and Avicenna, yes, animals do have a soul, but they have a collective soul. Because one does not remember the individual dog who was the pleasure of somebody living in the fourth century, but one remembers very well the soul of Socrates. If each human being recapitulates that universal history, then he or she participates in that forced face space. If we have a dialogue of these different cultures, which we need among the representatives of all of these, then we have a very concrete way of solving uh, the present crisis. There are many concrete steps which we have to take to take, get out of this crisis. In the military field, we need the equivalent of the strategic defense initiative, which makes the idea to make nuclear weapons obsolete technologically. And we need a new security architecture. To end the casino economy, we need a global class Steagall and a new Bretton Woods system, a new credit system. And we need a new paradigm in the relations among nations, which respects sovereignty, non-interference, the existence of a different social system, and then, you know, things will completely change. We need a completely new modern health system in every single country in order to fight the pandemics, this one and coming one, and disease. We have to double agricultural production to end famine. We have to eradicate poverty through economic development forever for all of mankind. But all of these things will not work if we don't have a new, a new paradigm of classical culture, which <clears throat> will relate to the essence of the identity of mankind. Unlike the liberals uh, who say everything goes and everybody does according to their own taste, we say, Man is limitless perfectible through aesthetic education, morally, intellectually, and emotionally. And every human being has, with that method of aesthetic education, the potential to become a beautiful soul and a genius. And only if we as mankind as a whole make that leap is mankind going to be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Helga Tseplarouche will be available during the discussion period to uh, respond to your questions and thoughts. Uh, our next speaker that we're going to be hearing from is Dennis Speed. Dennis has been a leading 
organizer, a leader with the LaRouche movement for decades. And he speaks to us today, uh, reflecting his status as a regular host of our frequent programs, on the deeper roots of what is currently expressed as contemporary American political and other culture. His topic, the poetic principle. He joins us to address why and how America must return to a classical culture. Dennis Speed. Tenor George Shirley performed Franz Schubert's famous song, On Music, on May 27, 1993, as part of a tribute to the then recently deceased contralto Marian Anderson. At the concert's conclusion, Mr. Shirley informed me in an impromptu interview that there was no essential difference between the spirit of a German art song or lead and this. Doctors stood and 
Why was George Shirley right? Why is Roland Hayes' spiritual, Lil Boy, and Franz Schubert's hymn to music, Brothers in the Spirit? The classical principle and the poetic principle are identical. That principle is that there is an inherent beauty in truth itself. We hold these truths to be beautiful, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For 50 plus years, Caleb Bingham's book, The Columbian Orator, first published in 1797 and then in 23 subsequent editions, was the central text consulted by American school children and aspiring public speakers in the pulpit, on the law bench, and within the Congress. Because, in the words of one historian, a Republican discourse had to find the right pitch. He meant the right tone or what we might call the right voicing. A gentleman's language, but not an aristocrat's. Both the 21-year-old Abraham Lincoln and the 12-year-old Frederick Douglass were educated by passages from Cicero, Plato, Benjamin Franklin, and Lazare Carnot, as well as American, British, and French teachers clergymen and statesmen. Shakespeare is a second great influence on American life of that period. The Astor Place Riot of May 1849, which left at least 22 people dead and 120 injured, was between two Shakespeare factions, the one supporting American actor Edwin Forrest, the other British aristocratic actor William Charles McCready. California gold prospectors entertained themselves at night by reciting whole passages of Shakespeare by heart. American Confederate and Union soldiers thrown into the fratricidal War of the Secession, 1861 to 65, if they were familiar with Shakespeare's Hamlet, could not have avoided hearing the echoes of the soliloquy of the murderous King Claudius, who killed his brother to ascend Denmark's throne, in the words of Lincoln's second inaugural address. Oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal eldest curse upon it, a brother's murder. 
Pray can I not, though inclination be as sharp as will. My stronger guilt defeats my strong intent, and like a man to double business bound, I stand in pause where I shall first begin and both neglect. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? Where to serves mercy but to confront the visage of offence? And what's in prayer but this twofold force? To be forestalled ere we come to fall or pardoned being down. Then I look up, my fault is past. But oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder. That cannot be, since I'm still possessed of those effects for which I did the murder. My crown, my own ambition, and my queen. One eighth of the whole population were colored slaves not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the Southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow to cause the war, to strengthen, to perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war, the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and prayed to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a God, a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not that we be not judged it. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. The terrible truth of Lincoln's words was nonetheless beautiful, especially in its concluding vision of a renewed union with malice toward none, with charity for all. It was called by Frederick Douglass, who was present for the speech and had differences with Lincoln at various times, a noble effort. Assassination, however, proved the primary means for removing America's poets and men of vision. 41 days after his second inaugural address, Lincoln was dead. President John Kennedy's inaugural and Apollo speeches, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's 1963 I Have a Dream and 1968 mountaintop speeches are etched in the history and the forward motion of America. But King was also assassinated, as was Kennedy. King's inspiration for creative nonviolent direct action, India's liberator Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated in 1947. King's apparent opposite, the eloquent and fearless Malcolm X, whose international focus on Africa had superseded the narrow focus of the civil rights movement, and who was uncompromisingly dignified and fierce in his rejection of the slave mentality that then affected mostly African Americans and today affects far more people in the country was also assassinated. That murder, as well as the 1969 assassination in Chicago of Black Panther Party 21-year-old Fred Hampton, has received a new attention in the past three months. 
The threat of an alliance, a sort of coincidence of opposites between Dr. King and Minister Malcolm X, that would have organized all Americans through a particular effort around voting and elections, threatened to cause what Samuel P. Huntington and others caused, called a crisis of democracy. But when Robert Kennedy stopped an outbreak of violence in Cleveland, the night of Martin Luther King's murder, April 4th, 1968, by reciting a passage from the Greek poet Aeschylus, Robert Kennedy's favorite poet, he demonstrated what it actually takes to govern. Truth recited as a poem delivered to the people until at last, in our despite, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. He, King, Malcolm, and others actually threatened the renaissance of American classical culture through an intense public discourse, which from the founding of the nation had combined beauty with truth. How do we now educate a new generation to reject the information society in favor of the truthful society? That new generation must find beauty through music. Then they can find their way back to the truth. Economist Lyndon LaRouche gave an example of such an educational process, which he had witnessed in 1995. One of the things which was most delicious was we stopped in Leipzig and I had a very unusual experience uh, in the sense of participating for several hours in auditing the rehearsal of the Demonicor in Leipzig. And then the next evening at the evening Vesper service, hearing the performance of the complete repertoire for that week at the service and being able to compare what had been gone through with the rehearsal and what was heard in the evening. Now, let me just qualify for those who may not know it. Some of you here do know this. The Thomas, the Saint, the uh, Thomas Cathedral Choir is a separate school, has been in existence since the year A.D. 1212. It has, according to all reputation, an unbroken singing program that it would sing every week on Friday evening at Vesper service. And that's been going on since A.D. 1212. The nearest thing they had to a break was in the middle of the Black Death in the middle of the 14th century, at which point uh, they were down to three boys because the Black Death was, was killing off the singers, but they still sang. So the, rep the word is that... Uh, that they've, they've always, they've sung for almost 800 years. Now, the discipline is tremendous. The cantor who is conducting the performance is himself a product of the school and uh, was a very trained musician, about 40 years of age, but a full bearer of the tradition. Let me just identify the tradition and then I'll come back to and do a course how it bears on here. They, every week, these boys who range from seven to about 18, that is there is a secondary school program. They are chosen for their voice and their musicality. And they're, but they're given a full gymnasium education, like a secondary school from that time until they complete graduation. Their musical work is done as a part of the total program of studies each week from the beginning of the week until Friday, four days a week normally, except this particular week where they only had three days because of a holiday. Four, four days or three days a week in this case. They start from scratch with a completely new repertoire for that week's Friday evening Vespa service. They learn from scratch. They then perform on Friday and the following week take up a complete new program. So in about three years or so, they've gone through pretty much the entire Bach motet and cantata repertoire. And they won't forget it, I assure you. They never will forget it. I saw the performance. Not only are they well trained, but this particular discipline is very important. I've seen perhaps not as many rehearsals as some of you have seen, but I've seen a number. And I can tell you the density in the rehearsal, the density of, of direction was about as intense of it as I've ever seen. But the boys were responsive and trained and able to do it. During the three-hour rehearsal, 
there was a break of about 15 minutes, in which these very serious, intent young boys and older boys, sitting in their chairs, cross-legged and otherwise, but nonetheless singing in very intent in the most professional manner, suddenly turned into boys, fresh boys. And they raced out of the area into the yard, played soccer, then came back in as fresh as they had left and sat down sedately, or as sedately as boys can do, <laughs> in their chairs. And they concentrated totally on what they were doing. So it was total concentration and total training and a masterful direction. Now, the particular work, which was the featured work of the Friday program, which they were rehearsing this Thursday morning when we were in there, Thursday noontime, was Jesu Meine Freude, which is one of the most difficult motets to perform adequately, not to perform it, but to perform it ad adequately in the motet repertoire. It has challenges in there which are rather astonishing. The boys were learning it. The direction was intense. The management of the direction was intense. Nothing passed. Everything was corrected. Diction, approaches, everything was in, involved. The following evening, I missed the intervening rehearsal, which was done as the dress rehearsal in the morning on Friday. But we were at the evening rehearsal. And I tell you, one of the few times in recent years hearing a musical performance, the tears came spontaneously flowing out of my eyes. Couldn't hold them back. The performance was magnificent. Everything that they had been taught, that they had rehearsed, every correction came through in the, in the performance. And better, of course, much better. The boys came in intent. They came, there are about 80 of them. Two groups, the young boys who were the pre-voice change and the young men who were the older after voice change. They came in with a canto behind, every one of them fully concentrated as a, as a musical performer, prepared to perform. And that moment of total concentration is required before you've got the idea of your composition in your head, before you start to perform. They came marching in with that idea in their head, a full program. They performed. They performed with precision, with shaping of tone. They sang not on the notes, but they sang between the notes. They knew how to do that. They were trained for that. It's the most remarkable performance of Jesu Meine Freude I've ever heard. Now, those who 35 years ago, uh, on March 18th, 1986, may have first heard of Lyndon LaRouche in connection with the victories of two of his associates in state primary elections in Illinois, and may think of him as primarily a presidential candidate uh, from the year of 1976 election all the way through 2004, may be surprised to now learn that at the very same time of those Illinois primaries, LaRouche initiated a campaign to restore the proper tuning of voices and instruments to opera houses throughout the world. Why? Here he explains it with the help of two of his friends, the great tenor Carlo Braganzi and baritone Piero Cappuccilli, two of the finest singers of the 20th century in opera. We begin with Maestro Bergonzi, who is the honorary host today, as he has here his Verdi Academy of Busseto, and then Piero Cappuccilli, who just a few days ago celebrated the 40th year of his singing career. And finally, Lyndon LaRouche, the international guest who commissioned the American original of our book, Singing and Tuning, which we're presenting today. Well, Maestro Bergonzi, why is this question of the Verdi tuning pitch so important for voices singing Verdi? As you know, we brought out the book in the United States originally, and I gave a demonstration of the two different tunings at Carnegie Hall. So I'm honored to present the book here today in the hometown of Giuseppe Verdi. But in the end, we've found that we really have not made a breakthrough. And this upsets me greatly, but I have to say it because we always need to tell the truth. We have Mr. LaRouche here today. He's very deeply committed to this question, which is so important to the young people, especially young singers, 
since they have to misplace all their technique by a half tone. And that's when they're lucky. Sometimes it's even worse. Now, we have not found a following among orchestral musicians, except for a few, especially among orchestral conductors, especially the symphonic orchestras. They just don't want to lower the tuning. What they want to do is to let the violins sing out, they want to let the brass sing out, but they don't realize that they can't regulate the human vocal chords. And this is the big point. The big problem is this. If we don't arrive at the lower tuning, or at least at a compromise between today's tuning and the Verdi tuning, then I have to tell you something which is really not very comforting. And, and that is that in a few years, we can just forget about hearing opera singers because all the voices will have been placed in the wrong way. We simply won't have the low voices. We won't have the high voices because when it's half a tone too high, it destroys the entire vocal technique. I don't want to seem to be a bird of ill omen. And I want the Schiller Institute to go battling forward, always move forward, always remain strong. I want LaRouche to persevere. I want him to keep going on this, on this issue. And I will give all the help which is, which is possible. But uh, in the end, I'm afraid that we really have not had a very big success. So thank you. We hope so too. And the most difficult battles are the ones we like to fight. Now I'll ask Maestro Capuccilli, who's been with us in this campaign for the Verdi tuning, ever since the first international conference at the Casa Verdi in 1988 where he sang musical examples in both tunings, high and low. This began a tradition which will be followed today here in the Sala Barezzi by Antonella Banaudi. Maestro Capuccilli, from your 40 years experience as a singer, what's the importance of the Verdi tuning for preserving opera, especially for Verdi? It's easy to say why. The Verdi tuning is the right one. Human voices are made for the Verdi tuning, in the sense that when the pitch is increased, the voices get tired, and in long rolls they can't stand the strain. That's the fact. But the orchestral directors are only concerned with the orchestra, because they want the violins to sound off with a certain tonality. Loud, because they must ring out, the brass must ring out. But the voices are not brass. Nature made them natural. They are not brass. And now, what should we do? We should try to make really sure, to try with Mr. LaRue, that we insist to, to fight for the Verdi tuning, at least for all the new voices coming up, to be able to sing, to be able to do it right, without forcing it. Now I'll ask Mr. LaRouche a question, and I'll translate into English also. She'll translate this herself, and the answer will be in English. How can the Schiller Institute and you, with this international campaign, change the attitude of the music world on this question of tune? Well, it goes to a deeper question. That in my position, my specialty is a branch of science called physical economy. È una questione più profonda. La mia specialità è una branca della scienza che si chiama economia fisica. That I recognize that as few have recognized that the development of music in Europe, Bach and especially after Bach, Mozart through Verdi and Brahms, this school of music plays an essential part in the very functioning of a culture. E nel, come nella mia esperienza, anche come economista, mi sono accorto che la cultura europea, in particolare la cultura musicale da Bach fino a Brahms Verdi incluso, ha un ruolo fondamentale per lo sviluppo proprio della creatività. There's a certain relationship to the creative powers of mind which, with this music, which does not exist in any other form. E, e questo tipo di musica stimola la creatività umana più di qualunque altra forma d'arte. 
Quindi stiamo rischiando non solo di perdere questa cultura musicale, ma anche la, la civiltà stessa. Therefore I thought it urgent to try to preserve the distillation of those principles of music which are central to our culture. Ecco perché per me è così urgente eh, mettere per scritto in un certo senso i principi che hanno ispirato questa cultura musicale. And to look at these principles known to musicians from the standpoint of science. E a guardare a questi principi che sono noti ai musicisti dal punto di vista della scienza. So we can a new of e lo scopo è quello di educare una nuova generazione di insegnanti. Voglio dire una cosa, voglio dire ancora una cosa. E il fatto non è che va uh, bene la voce. In fact, it's not only the voices that are at stake. If you have a good voice, but with high tuning, even the heart is at stake. It makes for enormous fatigue when singing. Right? It's, it's not just bad for the heart, it's bad for the whole body. Now we have to go back to singing normally as Verdi had in mind. LaRouche was seeking a way for Americans and for all people to find their voices and to properly place their voices once again. As we said at the beginning, a public discourse in a republic has to find the right pitch. All of the citizens must be called upon to deliberate as one sovereign republic. The idea that Lincoln successfully finally achieved through his four-year presidency. And as not only a physical economist, but a statesman, presidential candidate LaRouche realized that if a nation has lost its voice, the greatest ideas cannot resonate in the hearts and minds of the people. For a nation to respond to a great crisis, a great task, a great moment, the people must hear that challenge as a voice from within them. And in the midst of crisis, of destruction and death, the tragedy of the moment must be enveloped in the promise of a far greater future that must be experienced as in harmony with what resonates from within them. Lifting citizens from the condition of self-imposed tragedy to a sublime recognition of our available immortality is the task of both the poet and the statesman. It is the task that best qualifies an American presidency and its citizenry, and as with the spiritual, is our unique contribution to the world's classical culture should we choose to make that so. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. 
that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Well, thank you very much, Dennis, for pulling together that, that presentation. Uh, referring back to uh, Lyndon LaRouche himself, I do want to let our viewers know that the LaRouche Legacy Foundation, which has published so far volume one of the Lyndon LaRouche Collected Works, is offering a special discount during the conference. You can see the link below where you can uh, get a discount by purchasing two of these books for $75. So take advantage. Our next speaker is Liliana Gorini, who joins us from Italy, where she chairs the Movimiento Solidarietà, my apologies Liliana, the LaRouche movement in Italy. This year is the 700th anniversary of the death of that great shaper of the Italian language, Dante Alighieri, the famous writer of the three-part commedia known to us today as the Divine Comedy. Liliana Gorini speaks to us today on the topic of Dante's Commedia, the way from hell to science and space exploration. Liliana. This year, we celebrate Dante's 700th death anniversary. He was born in 1265 in Florence and died in 1321 in Ravenna. The Italian poet created the Italian language at a time in which Italy was just a collection of city-states, often at war one against the other, and in which the high class spoke Latin, while the people only spoke dialects. As LaRouche often emphasized, the national language is profoundly connected to the nation state, and Dante consciously created the Italian language in order to free Italy from the oligarchy, which dominated at that time, and create a sovereign nation state. Before the Commedia, he wrote the Vulgari Eloquentia, which makes fun of all Italian dialects and the way they are used by the oligarchy to keep a population in ignorance and slavery. With his De Monarchia, he outlined the project to have a nation state based on common good. And he called on Emperor Arrigo VII, Henry VII of Germany, to free Italy from city-states and wars. He was therefore a leader of the Ghibelline faction, as opposed to the Guelph faction loyal to Pope Boniface VIII, a corrupt Pope who finally exiled Dante for his important political role, and he never could go back to Florence, his birth town. He wrote, the Commedia during his exile years, between 1307 and his death in 1321, in Ravenna, where he is buried. This Commedia, or Divine Comedy, is not only a masterwork in poetry, but also a treatise in history, religion, statecraft, economics, and science. As Boccaccio reported in his Vita di Dante, Dante's Life, after it was published, it immediately became very popular among the population, which used to read it, recite it, and discuss it in churches or in the piazza, something which still, to this day, was kept as a tradition by a number of classical actors such as Vittorio Gassman or Roberto Benigni, with their Lectura Dantis, recitation and explanation of Dante's Commedia. As for Giuseppe Verdi and his operas, Dante became a national hero as a poet and as a political leader. 
Many verses from the Commedia are to this day commonly used in daily language, such as non ti curar di lor, ma guarda e passa, the popular version of non ragioniam di lor, ma guarda e passa, let us not speak of them, but look and pass, or fatti non foste a viver come bruti, ma perseguir virtute, e conoscenza. What Ulysses tells his man, you were not made to live as brutes, but to follow virtue and knowledge. But Dante is not only dear to the Italian nation, particularly in the last year of suffering because of the COVID pandemic. He is an example of what Helga Zepp LaRouche often calls a dialogue of cultures. In his Commedia, he puts in his limbo the most important Arab scientist, Avicenna, Ipsina, next to Plato and Socrates, among those philosophers who could not be in paradise because they were not Christian, but they were just, and a reference point for the poet. He quotes Avicenna also in his Convivio, when he gives a quite accurate description of the Milky Way. In 1919, Spanish Arabist Don Miguel de Palacios published a study, La Eschatologia Musulmana in La Divina Commedia, in which he compares Dante's voyage in the afterlife to important works of the Arab Renaissance, including Avicenna, in which hell is described in a similar way, a funnel-shaped chasm built on concentric spheres, seven in Islam, nine in Dante, plus the limbo. In quoting Avicenna, then Dante passed on the beacon of the Arabic Renaissance, based on ancient Greek and Indian scholars, making the Golden Renaissance possible. And today, it is important to relieve his voyage from hell to paradise in order to make a new Renaissance possible based on poetry and science. When I looked for Gassman's video of his first count of the Inferno on YouTube, I found many comments of normal people who were listening to it again and reading it again, because during the one year of COVID pandemic, in which Italy was in lockdown almost all of the time, and still is, with the highest toll in terms of death, 100,000 dead, it became clear to many what Dante meant with the beginning of the Commedia when he wrote his opening Terzina, speaking of fear of death and the dark forest in which he found himself. So let's speak about Dante's Commedia, starting with the first Terzinas. Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la diritta via era smarrita. Ah, quanto a dir qual era e cosa dura esta selva selvaggia e aspra e forte che nel pensier rinnova la paura, tante amara che poco è più morte, ma per trattar del ben che io vi trovai, dirò delle altre cose io vo scorte. Which in English means midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. Ah me, how hard the thing it is to say, what was this forest savage, rough and stern, which in the very thought renews the fear. So bitter it is, death is little more, but of the good to treat which there I found, Speak will I of the other things I saw. 
These are the beginning tercinas of Dante's Commedia, where you already can hear the power and musicality of his poetic language and the use of onomatopoeic sounds, that is, sounds which give the idea of a concept or feeling he is transmitting. In this case, fear, emphasized by the many rolled R's of esta selva selvaggia e aspra e forte che nel pensier rinnova la paura, tante amara e poco e più morte. Paura, morte, amara are fear, death, bitter. Dante is in the midway of his life. The poet was 35 and exiled, and he's terrified and does not know how to come out of this dark forest. Fortunately, he meets Virgil, which he calls il sommo poeta, the supreme poet, but also duca e maestro, guide and maestro, and who will guide him in this difficult voyage through hell and purgatory, while his guide in paradise will be Beatrice, the angel-like woman of the Dolce Stil Novo. Beatrice appears already in the second canto when Dante starts to doubt about his ability to face this voyage. He says, I am not St. Paul or Aeneas, St. Paul speaks of his voyage to paradise in the second letter to the Corinthians, while Virgil's hero, Aeneas, visited the Ade, the kingdom of the dead, in his Aeneid. Three women help Dante to overcome his fears and doubts. Beatrice is the first one. She appears in this canto and tells him, Io son Beatrice, che ti faccio andare. Beatrice am I, who do bid thee go. The second one is the Madonna, who asks Beatrice to intercede by Saint Lucia for Dante. And Beatrice will play a very important role in Paradiso, where she represents not only the angel-like woman of the Dolce in Novo, Amor mi mosse, che mi fa parlare, but she represents also the revelation of God and science, and she will explain to Dante the physics of the spheres. In Inferno, Dante meets many sinners of his time, including Pope Boniface, who exiled him, or Count Ugolino, who was sent to jail with his children by another corrupt member of church, and had to watch his children starve in jail, an episode which got Goethe called one of the highest in poetry and tragedy. But maybe the most revealing canto for Dante's conception of economic justice is Canto 17 in Inferno, in which he meets usurers who, together with sodomites, are punished for their sins against nature and labor. In Italia, na in Italian, natura e arte. But here art is not meant as artistic production, but simply as labor, work, as opposed to what Dante calls subiti guadagni, rushed gains, a concept in which many Dante scholars see a very strong critique of Dante against not only usurers, but also speculators. This was the time when great merchant bank houses started to make quick money from money, as opposed to labor. In this canto, Dante continues the indictment of the Florentine nobility and oligarchy from the previous canto. Usurers are punished in boiling sand and covered by flames which burn them. And in this circle, Dante and Virgil meet Girion, one of the many demons of Inferno, who represents fraud, quella sozza immagine di frode, that filthy effigy of fraud. Usurers have a money bag 
is a family crest hanging from their neck. And this is how he recognizes them. If he wrote the Commedia today, we should find in this circle people like Mark Carney, George Soros, Klaus Schwab, or Mario Draghi, and all the representatives of the Great Reset, all burnt by fire in Eterno. In a few minutes, I cannot go into the rest of Inferno Purgatorio, but I can end with Dante's ascent to paradise, which starts a few days after Easter Sunday. Dante and Beatrice are lifted skyward by a kind of heavenly gravity, and they visit the, not, the nine heavenly spheres, Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the fixed stars, and finally, the primum mobile, the prime cause of motion, which is God himself. During their ascent, they discuss questions of religion, including the role of providence, which works through indirect means, but also individual souls, directly pe directing people in various ways. But they also discuss questions of science, with Beatrice explaining, for example, the physics of the spheres and the nine hierarchies of angelic powers. Dante can withstand brief glances at the blazing sun, the light of heaven representing God, and ends the last canto of Paradiso and of his Commedia with these beautiful words, l'amor che muove il sole e l'altre stelle, the love which moves the sun and the other stars. And as in Beethoven or Mozart, in which the theme of the beginning comes back, we are reminded of the end of Inferno. E quindi uscimmo a riveder le stelle. And finally, we came out to see the stars again. And thanks to Dante and his poetry, we understand that we shall come out of hell, we shall come out of the pandemic, economic and social crisis, if we look up to the stars. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana. This image that Dante presents of paradise is so at odds with the sensuous one that many people have in mind when thinking about that, and so aligned with the creative beauty that allows us to achieve an immortality during our lives, that it's a, a true inspiration to, to reflect on. I do want to let our viewers know that if you uh, have not yet joined the Schiller Institute, I encourage you to give a call right now. Our uh, phone line is available for you, 917-475-8828. Call to talk to a real live person at the Schiller Institute, 917-475-8828. Our next speaker is Diane Sayre. She is running for U.S. Senate from the state of New York as a LaRouche Independent. She is eager to give Chuck Schumer the retirement that so many of us are eager for him to enjoy. Diane is also the founding director of the New York City Schiller Institute Community Chorus. Today, she brings her passionate commitment to political beauty and to cultural truth in her presentation, which she has titled Beethoven in the Garden of Gethsemane. Diane Sayre. Thanks, Jason. Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on your time zone. As you know, the year now is 2021, but thanks to the COVID pandemic, we are going to continue celebrating the 250th year of Beethoven's birth because everything that needed to be done in 2020 wasn't. And our leader, Helga Zepp LaRouche, has proposed that we carry on the Beethoven year until everyone thinks like Beethoven. So I think we'll be studying Beethoven for at least a few years more. As you will be hearing over today and tomorrow, we have many challenges to overcome right now. I know many Americans after Biden was sworn in as president 
felt very hopeless. And I suspect many people in Europe under the EU uh, have a similar sense, perhaps for other reasons. But the sense is that we have lost the ability to control our own future. Since God created man with free will, it must be the case that there is always a potential to change our destiny, but how? In 1990, near the end of his first year in prison, Lyndon LaRouche dictated a brief introduction to the book Bridge Across Jordan, which was the autobiography of civil rights movement heroine Amelia Boynton Robinson. It was entitled In the Garden of Gethsemane, and it begins with a quote from the book of Matthew. A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. LaRouche says in this that one way to approximate the question of Gethsemane is to imagine the world 50 years after your death and to look back at your life, not as a series of events, but as a totality. What did you contribute for the good of mankind? He says that every human being has the right to leave an immortal legacy of goodness for humanity for generations to come. And most importantly for us here today, he says, yes, we must struggle against injustice, but it is not enough to struggle out of anger. We must struggle out of love and that we learn best who have had to walk as leaders of one degree or another through our own Gethsemane with the image of the cross before us. Since this is an international conference and includes people of many different faiths and cultures, and I'm afraid some Christians might have forgotten, let's recall what happened at Gethsemane. Christ had just informed his disciples that their dinner would be the last supper and that he was going to be taken away to be crucified. Christ then became very sad and walked to the Garden of Gethsemane with three of his disciples and asked them to stand watch and pray while he went off a little ways to pray alone. There he asked God if it were possible to let the bitter cup pass from his lips. He said, but not as my will, but thy will be done. He returned to his disciples three different times and each time found them sleeping, which provided the answer. Christ accepted the cup. But accepting death was not the only hardship. Go back to the Matthew quote. Imagine acting for the good of others at great risk or even death to yourself, but also being ridiculed and reviled for it. Amelia often told us, how many people told her, stay away from Dr. King? And she observed that people would cross the street to avoid being seen with him. Many of us are familiar with what happened to LaRouche in this regard. Think about what was done to Christ in the hours leading up to the crucifixion. He was stripped and whipped and then dressed with a purple robe and a crown of thorns and people mocked him. Oh, you think you're so great, King of the Jews, Son of God, where's your God now? They spat on him and laughed as they taunted him while he walked carrying the cross upon which he was to be crucified. Now, let's take the case of Beethoven and his own moment of decision, which he expressed in his famous Heiligenstadt Testament and Will, written in 1802 when he was 31 years of age. At 28, this musical genius was completely deaf, nearly, and things took a turn for the worse after he tried many remedies. You might imagine what it would be like to be known as a great musician and the terror of people discovering that you couldn't hear. But we'll have Beethoven tell you in his own words. O oh, you men who think or say that I am malevolent, stubborn, or misanthropic, how greatly do you wrong me? You do not know the secret cause which makes me seem that way to you, but think that for six years now I have been hopelessly afflicted 
made worse by senseless physicians from year to year deceived with hopes of improvement, finally compelled to face the prospect of a lasting malady whose cure will take years or perhaps be impossible. For me, there can be no relaxation with my fellow men, no refined conversations, no mutual exchange of ideas. I must live almost alone, like one who has been banished. I mix with society only as much as necessity demands. If I approach near to people, terror seizes upon me and I fear being exposed to the danger that my condition might be noticed. But what a humiliation for me when someone standing next to me heard a flute in the distance and I heard nothing. Or someone standing next to me heard a shepherd singing and again I heard nothing. Such incidents drove me almost to despair. A little more of that and I would have ended my life. It was only my art that held me back. Ah, it seemed to me impossible to leave the world until I had brought forth all that I felt was within me. Beethoven wasn't composing for fame and glory like some rock star, but to a noble mankind. It is decreed that I must now choose patience for my guide. This I have done. I hope the resolve will not fail me steadfastly to persevere till it may please the inexorable fates to cut the thread of my life. Perhaps I may get better, perhaps not. I am prepared for either. That final sentence is the key. I am prepared for either. Beethoven had resolved that he would continue to pour forth his talent even if he never regained his hearing because he knew that that was his appointed mission. We're going to hear how Beethoven addresses exactly this idea in one particular case. He really does it in all of his compositions. But there's another important musical case of Gethsemane, and that is the source of the compelling power of the Negro spiritual as expressed by composer and arranger William Dawson in an essay he wrote about this music for one of his recordings. He chooses a ruling from the legislature of South Carolina in 1741, which was apparently intended to put a curb on the torturing of slaves. Quote, in case any person shall willfully cut out the tongue, put out the eye, castrate, or cruelly scald, burn, or deprive any slave of any limb or member, or shall inflict any other cruel punishment other than by whipping or beating with a horsewhip, cowskin, switch, or small stick, or by putting irons on, or by confining or imprisoning such slave, every person shall, for every such offense, forfeit the sum of 100 pounds current money. With such a background, we marvel at the lack of a single word of hate in the religious folk songs of the Negro. In the midst of inhumanity, he sang, Lord, I want to be a Christian. I want to be like Jesus. In these songs, one can hear the cry for deliverance and freedom, which lurks behind every measure because the Negro literally poured his heart into them. Besides suffering, Slavery brought to the Negro the story of Jesus. In that story, the slave found the counterpart of his own tragic experiences and instantly claimed the hero of that epic drama for his own, which gives the meaning to the oft-recurring Ma Jesus in these songs. The slave identified himself with the savior of all mankind whose travail and triumph became the hope and assurance of his own deliverance. So now, let's first hear how Bach and Marian Anderson deal with the question of Gethsemane in Bach's St. John's Passion. The aria you will hear occurs after Christ has been hung on the cross but is still alive. He sees his mother and one of his disciples below and tells his mother to take the disciple as her son and the disciple to care for his mother. After receiving a sip of vinegar from a sponge raised to his lips on a long pole, 
Christ says, it is fulfilled, es ist vollbracht, obviously meaning not merely that he has taken care of his mother, but that he has fulfilled his mission. So we're going to hear the cello and Marian Anderson play this, and then there's going to be a break. I'm just cutting it for time reasons, and we'll shift to the part where the battle is won. Marian Anderson sings the words, the man of Judah fought the fight. And remember, the victory is because with Christ's death, all human beings can be forgiven of their sins. So this is a case of the sublime, because by dying, Christ lives and gives mankind the gift of immortality. So we'll just hear those two sections, the beginning and the end. Now, I'll conclude by just letting you listen to the ending of Beethoven's Sonata Opus 110, uh, which he wrote actually 200 years ago this year in 1821. Uh, go and listen to the whole sonata later, and you can hear what Beethoven does and the victory. And I'd like to thank Dora June for this recording.
Well, thank you, Diane Sayer, and thank you, Dora June, for that performance. That was, that was really very moving. Our next speaker comes to us from Mexico. Carolina Dominguez is a leader of the Mexican Schiller Institute, and she's been doing some very useful work in expanding the access of young people to the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche and the Schiller Institute. She's been doing this in part through getting LaRouche and his outlook onto the curricula at uh, universities. She speaks to us today on that topic, the how to address the crisis in education, LaRouche in the universities. Carolina Dominguez. Good morning. I'm Carolina Dominguez of the Schiller Institute in Mexico. I'm very happy to be at this conference and we welcome you to it. I would like to begin my presentation by reading a few excerpts from our campaign initiative, La Rouge in the Universities, which we launched last month. I would ask you to please read the full document and sign it if you agree to join this campaign. And please leave us your contact information to be able to get back in touch with you to dialogue further about it. And please forward it to other people who might be interested. La Rouge in the universities, an example of true agape, what really is power. We youth from around the world and members of the International Schiller Institute have posed the question as to whether we are really doing the right thing in terms of academic and moral education of so many of the planet's youth. In replying, we discover the paradox that if we are doing the right thing, the grave international systemic crisis we face wouldn't exist. What we instill in the minds and hearts of our youth through their education will give them the tools to decide what they will do with their lives, taking up the mission of a commitment to society to improve our universe. With the method Lyndon LaRouche's ideas represent, the word commitment won't frighten them. They will see it in the realization of their ideals as they better themselves and consequently seek the improvement and benefit of their fellow man. This is our petition that we begin education and training in the method developed by Lyndon LaRouche through courses, workshops, seminars, graduate courses, conferences, contests, experiments, science and art fairs to take place in academies, universities, forums, courses and classes. We aren't demanding. We are offering the opportunity to give young people what belongs to them by natural law, that is, to create an inflection point in history, an option that differs from the pessimism they breathe. That's an excerpt from our initiative, which we would like you to use through this presentation I want to let those of you attending this conference know that we are working through the original writings of authors who have transformed our society. That's the heart of LaRouche's method, the discovery of universal principles and ideas that can shape history. If you look at our petition more closely, you will see photographs of the work that we have been doing during this period. In the workshops or classes that we have organized, we are getting youth to make discoveries for themselves because LaRouche, Kepler, Leonardo da Vinci, the Greeks did that, and we have to do it as well. If you look at Leonardo's sketches, after having gone through the Schiller Institute's geometry workshops, for example, you will see drawings of the five platonic solids. These are the five regular solids that can be constructed. For example, the octahedron, which is the one I have here. As you can see, all of the sides are identical. Or for example, the tetrahedron, which is this one. By engaging in construction and working through the characteristics of each one of the solids, 
we find that we need to look at Luca Pacioli's book, The Divine Proportion. The sketches in Luca Pacioli's book were drawn by Leonardo da Vinci. If you go back and look at those sketches, after having gone through one of the Schiller Institute's workshops, you will see that they are very similar. I'm not saying that we are Leonardo da Vinci, but I'm saying that this is the path. This is the path that allows us to understand the mind, the intention of those authors. This process, when you are working through books such as Johannes Kepler's Secrets of the Universe or These Solids, you start to feel more capable. You start to feel happy because it becomes something that is yours, something that nobody can take from you because it's yours. It becomes almost like a tattoo for the soul. The experience of discovery, as LaRouche said, gives you real freedom. It gives you power, the power of ideas, the power to discover for yourself, to have your own judgment. But it doesn't end there. When you are able to help another person to make the same discovery that you made, or a discovery of Kepler's or Leonardo's, but with his own process, you realize that there is a connection between your minds that is agape, that is to educate, to guide. That is the power of ideas. It is what we do in the school which Lyndon LaRouche left us. And it is the dynamic that we want to achieve in the universities because it generates a Socratic dialogue of profound ideas, an exchange of hypotheses, not only about the discovery which has been made, but also about the application of that discovery for the welfare of the population. The changes in the dynamic that the incorporation of that new discovery has brought about and the new paradoxes that it generates. You will find that this leads to a change in the way the student thinks. We don't make them memorize concepts they don't understand and which only feed into the fragility of their thinking. Or if they do generate it, they think that they can't change anything. They only have spasms of thinking that they might be successful, but they won't achieve the quality of leadership that is needed to change history. On the contrary, we have to make them part of the living process, of a social process. That kind of working together and dynamic will lead to a level of collaboration you never see in the classrooms today. The universities will then demonstrate the level of commitment that a group of citizens can have towards their nations. This is an example of what our political leaders can achieve on all levels. This will be the true education of youth and leaders. This is what we are doing with the campaign to bring LaRouche to the universities, working with different professors around the world to have every student participate, to have every youth on this planet participate in this process, not as a multiple choice test which doesn't reflect anything at all about their ability, but does make it possible to reject them. Instead, we will generate a process of transformation such that the students master the principle of discovery, of principles that can be applied for the welfare of the population. Throughout this conference, you are going to hear presentations with proposals our movement is making. Energy systems, health systems, systems for the standard of living of our population to improve. This is the campaign of La Rouge in the universities as an example of true agape, and we are inviting every professor 
every person who is in touch with youth, every youth, whether you are in college or not, we want this to become a real dynamic, a living dynamic. This is what I'm inviting you to join, to participate in this process. And the first benefit is for you, the power to have your own true judgment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina. Thank you very much. We have two more speakers on this panel before we open up the discussion and bring our panelists together. Before the remaining two speakers, we have another musical selection. This is an offering in honor of the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth, which we are continuing to celebrate. This is a 2017 performance of Beethoven's Abendlied Untum Gestirnten Himmel, Evening Song Under the Starry Sky, a beautiful perspective on life and immortality. The collaborators on this are John Segerson, the Schiller Institute music director, singing, and Margaret Greenspan accompanying him on the piano. Long. Um. 
Thank you, John. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Beethoven. Again, as we approach our discussion period, I want to remind our viewers that we are going to be taking questions via questions at schillerinstitute.org. We've had about a dozen come in so far, and those that we're not able to address today will be forwarded to the, the panelists uh, to be able to respond to later. Our next speaker is Megan DeBrote. She is the president of the U.S. Schiller Institute. She worked for several years, as did I, with directly with Lyndon LaRouche in a science and economics research team that he personally oversaw. She also serves on the board of the Schiller Institute NYC Community Chorus and on the board of the LaRouche Legacy Foundation. Speaking of the LaRouche Legacy Foundation, let me remind you that, uh, again, we're having a special on volume one of the Lyndon LaRouche Collected Works. You can see the deal there. Two books delivered, $75. So take advantage uh, at the link below, bit.ly slash LLF dash BOGO. So uh, Megan is going to be speaking to us today about our cultural potential, our extraterrestrial cultural uh, potential. She's titled her talk, Three Mars Missions and the Galactic Species. Megan DeBroad. In February 2021, Three heavenly visitors descended on Mars. One, a rover with a helicopter on board. Another, an orbiter lander pair. And the third, an orbiter which will study the Martian atmosphere. These three visitors sent by the United States, China, and the United Arab Emirates respectively, are humanity's emissaries our robotic representatives, which extend the human sensory apparatus to another world. To say a few things about each of these missions, NASA's Perseverance rover landed in Jezero Crater, which billions of years ago may have been a lake about the size of Lake Tahoe. Perseverance has a mission of searching for signs of past microbial life preparing samples for a future sample return mission, perhaps by the end of the decade, creating breathable oxygen from in situ resources, and flying the first helicopter on another planet. China's Tianwen-1 orbiter will study, among other things, Mars's topography and geological structure, the characteristics of the Martian soil and groundwater distribution, and, in a couple of months, the orbiter will release a lander and rover to the surface and will make China the first nation to attempt an orbiter and a lander in its first Mars mission. The HOPE orbiter of the UAE, whose space agency is just six years old, will study the atmosphere from top to bottom for at least one Martian year, including its composition, temperature, and weather, becoming thus Mars's first weather satellite. While these three missions come out of national space programs, each in various stages of development, all of them will perform important work over the next months and years, which will contribute new knowledge, new discoveries to benefit all of humanity. Now, while all of this is occurring millions of kilometers off of the Earth, it might just be the most important thing going on on the Earth. As was stated quite beautifully by the chair of the UAE Space Agency, 33-year-old Sarah Al-Amiri, the Emirates Mars mission has inspired the nation to look to the future and look to the skies. It has shown that collaboration across nations, geographies, creeds, in the face of remarkable challenges, can forge brilliant outcomes for the benefit of us all. So this brings us to why humanity's activity in space is an appropriate topic for a discussion of a Renaissance culture on Earth. Now, in one sense, perhaps it's obvious 
that a successful culture would be pursuing the frontiers of science, of technology, for the benefit of its population. Yes, that's true. But there's something deeper. There's a cultural aspect to this, which goes very deep into the consequences for humanity's future. How will space exploration change mankind? How will it change our role in the solar system, in the universe at large? Therefore, how will it change our identity as a species of life? Croft Erica, who was a great technological and philosophical mind, a good friend of Lyndon and Helga LaRouche, and also a member of the advisory board of the Schiller Institute, spent many decades contemplating this question. On the one hand, Croft Erica designed in great detail the steps that mankind must take in order to build up the infrastructure to live and work on the moon. He designed a city on the moon called Selenopolis with its accompanying fusion power plants and industrial operations. And he also imagined a distant, though foreseeable future, when humanity might have developed million-person satellite cities, which he called Astropolis, each with its own unique orbit like a planet, which, he said, eventually would have the ability to set off on multi-generational journeys beyond the solar system to other galaxies. In all of this, Erica asked not only how would humanity change and alter the moon, asteroids, Mars, but how would our becoming an extraterrestrial species change mankind? For example, what would be the national identity of the first person born on the moon? How would he or she relate to the cultures of Earth? How would such a child see the role of the human mind in the universe as we bring life to other planets. In a 1957 article called The Anthropology of Astronautics, Erica wrote the following. The idea of traveling to other celestial bodies reflects to the highest degree the independence and agility of the human mind. It lends ultimate dignity to man's technical and scientific endeavors. Above all, it touches on the philosophy of his very existence. As a result, the concept of space travel disregards national borders, refuses to recognize the differences of historical, historical or ethnological origin, and penetrates the fiber of one sociological or political creed as fast as that of the next. Because of this, Space travel holds perhaps the greatest general appeal for our complex and divided world. It seems to promise less immediate material gain than atomic technology. Yet, or perhaps therefore, its spiritual appeal is extremely powerful, symbolizing as it does that man, after all, has not yet lost his capability of cutting the Gordian knot, of exploding old notions which retard his development, and of overcoming seemingly invincible physical obstacles. If it can be done here, it can eventually also be done in other segments of our life today, where man seems to be hopelessly and perpetually deadlocked. Lyndon LaRouche, another great scientific and philosophical genius, wrote and spoke for many decades about the necessity for a 40-year mission for the colonization of the Moon and Mars, and he made such a program the centerpiece of his 1988 presidential campaign. Many years later, in the midst of recruiting a new generation of youth, LaRouche wrote a paper called The Principle of Power. This paper takes up the need to rise above the decadent 
reductionist culture, which had come to dominate science in the West, and to forge a notion, a new notion of the human identity, not based on sense perception, but based on the power of the human mind in and over the universe. LaRouche ends that writing with the following charge. We must change the image of man from the relatively poor conception prevalent today to a notion of man in the image of the creator, mankind with a mission in the universe, a mission in which persons should enjoy the right of a sense of participation in this great universal mission. We require sovereign states because that is the only way in which the effective cultural development of the new individual can occur. But we are otherwise one species with one unifying mission for all time to come. We must reflect that imparted sense of personal identity in each sovereign individual person. We must look upward to space so that we are impelled even within our daily missions, to see ourselves and one another in a better way than mankind generally has seen mankind in the past. So where will we go from here? One of the most beautiful aspects of the three current Mars missions, as with most other space missions underway, is that they are distinctly international in character. All of them were collaborative efforts of many nations. This month, Russia and China announced an agreement to build a base at the South Pole of the Moon. The United States plans to launch and land people on the moon again within the decade. China will launch its space station later this spring and has plans for manned landings on the moon and Mars in the coming decades. The UAE has announced back in 2017 that they will colonize Mars by 2117. We can and absolutely should be proud of this year's accomplishments at Mars. But compared to where we could have been if Mr. LaRouche's vision had been followed, in a sense, we've been treading water for many decades now not because of technological obstacles. Those either have or can be overcome, but because of spiritual deficiencies, a cultural degeneracy in the West especially. We've almost lost a sense of what Lyndon LaRouche and Kraft Erika pointed to as the goodness of human creativity in our universe. So I suggest that we take Lyndon LaRouche's advice and look upward to space so that we are impelled, even within our daily missions, to see ourselves and one another in a better way than mankind generally has seen mankind in the past. Thank you very much, Megan. So I want to give our panelists a two-minute warning that our last speaker is, she said she's going to be very brief, she's making an announcement, and then we will uh, bring up our whole panel for discussion. So we'll hear now from our last uh, presenter on this panel, Anastasia Battle, an activist with the LaRouche Organization in the U.S. Midwest. Anastasia. Hello, thank you so much for joining us for a special conference today. My name is Anastasia Battle, and I have the privilege of announcing a new magazine that we will be putting out every quarter, and it's called the Leonora. Let me just give you a sense of what the Leonora is about by reading you our mission statement. It has become increasingly clear that the creative output of our organization is not only good, but vitally necessary for a successful upshift of humanity. We seek to incorporate art science and statecraft as a single force of discovery, which is humanity's true power and best defense against empire. Under that direction, we want Leonora to be an organizing tool for the youth of the world. Pedagogies and polemics should be presented using LaRouche's polemical method. 
and will be organized according to a top-down strategic intervention, giving special regard to insights into the axioms we encounter in political organizing. Now you can get a subscription to this by becoming a sustaining member of the Schiller Institute, making a monthly contribution of at least $5. And we'll link down below on how you can do that. And for the time being, we'll be sending it out as a digital copy, but in the future, we'll be putting forward a uh, membership to get a paper version. So I really hope that you enjoy uh, using this to organize all over the world. Uh, this will be a lot of fun and thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank you, Anastasia. So we will bring our panel together now for our discussion period. Um, we were planning for this panel I know that the schedule says that we were going to end in 15 minutes at one o'clock. I think we're going to be able to go a little longer than that to make sure we can have some uh, discussion. We have received many questions that came in and uh, feel free to send more to us questions at schillerinstitute.org, questions at schillerinstitute.org. I think that the uh, first order of business in our discussion um, among our panelists is that I'd like to ask Helga Zeplerusch, the founder of the Schiller Institute, uh, to offer her reflections on, um, on what you've heard on this panel as a whole, and then we'll, uh, we'll open it up for some more discussion. Well, I can say it made me very happy uh, because, I mean, first of all, the pure humanity which has been expressed by the other speakers, you know, is actually what should set the standard of how human beings relate to each other. And then naturally, um, you know, there were um, video clippings from some of the great artists, you know, where we had the privilege to know them, like Norbert Breinin, who was the first violinist of the Amadeus Quartet, or uh, Carlo Bergonzi, Piero Capuccilli, these were all dear friends from us from, from Italy. And naturally Warfield, William Warfield and Sylvia Olden Lee and Kraft Erike naturally. Um, <clears throat> fortunately, some of, some of them are still alive, but all of those I mentioned now have passed. And I regard it as one of the most happy occurrences of my life to have known such people and worked with them and, you know, especially, I think the uh, concert for Lynn for his 65th birthday uh, in Bernkastel Kuhs in the beautiful Vino Cotec, which is also used as a concert hall uh, immediately on the side of the <coughs> birth house, or not the birth house, but the library and the hospital, which was donated by uh, Nikolaus was from of Kuhs, which is still operational since in, un, without interruption since 600 years. This was the perfect setting for Lynn's birthday. And, you know, these are the moments where, you know, that is what I tried to say in my initial remarks. When you access that kind of, you know, participation in creativity, in the creative work of, of great composers, poets, and scientists, then you experience a form of humanity, which is exactly what should be the vision for all of mankind. So I want to say I'm very happy. Great. Thank you very much. So what I'd like to do is we do have many questions. Uh, I'm going to pose questions probably a couple at a time, and then we'll just see who would like to respond to them. All panelists will have the opportunity to offer their reflections on the, the presentations and discussion as a whole um, before we close. So for the first topic, I'd like to ask two questions here um, uh, about the universality of classical culture. One question that comes in from Alain is, is Judeo-Christian culture the only one capable of arousing genius? And let me combine that with a question from Gregory. Gregory says, contemporary popular culture can be compared to a dungeon, which stirs only secondary emotions, such as thrill, anger, or sentimentality. Yet, sometimes it helps to be made angry, to enjoy a thrill, or to be soothed by sentimentality. Can we not view these forms of art as medicines, which can help certain wounded souls under certain circumstances? But society makes the mistake of considering them as daily bread, 
when that role should properly be reserved for classical culture? So I think these are two questions on the universality of classical culture. And if you'd like to respond, um, start responding or raise your hand or who would like to take those up? Okay. Can I, yeah, just I'd, I'll take the last one first. Um, actually, I don't think that weak and debased art, which arouses unproductive emotions in us can be healing. Um, I don't think there's a place for it. Uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, because when we are under it, I mean, if you listen, when you hear Beethoven, I hear in almost everything he writes that's of any length, this kind of impassioned uh, struggle, like what he experienced in Heiligenstadt, this, um, and then he overcomes that uh, and it's incredibly joyful and liberating. And when you hear that music, you are able to be trans, you're able to transcend whatever was going on into something higher. And as opposed to choosing something that either may mirror your state or be opposite of your state, but simply puts you in another state, like a state of sentimentality or a state of rage. And I think that uh, what people listen to, what people listen to, has an enormous amount to do with uh, how they act and um, whether they find the strength within themselves to take action when it is difficult. Uh, because today we are so bombarded with so many things that are false, but they are popular. To be truthful requires a certain amount of inner fortitude, and I think the right the classical uh, music strengthens that, and these other things um, cause you to be limp. <laughs> okay. Uh, li oh, well, okay, let's go to Helga and then Liliana. Um, on the first question, I, I think that this is unfortunately a very Eurocentric view. I mean, if you start to study the other cultures, you, first of all, China was the leading cultural and scientific nation until the 17th century. But if you look at the beauty of poetry in, um, in Indian culture, uh, in Japanese, in Persian, po Persian poems, uh, Chinese paintings. I mean, there are so many unbelievably beautiful things that it, it's more like a, a bunch of flowers, you know, where, you know, naturally you have roses and you have tulips and other flowers, which all are different. But would you want to miss any of them? And I think it's the beauty of the creation, you know, which in my view, Kepler was absolutely right when he said that the more you study it, you recognize that there is an unbelievably beautiful divine plan and the cultural expressions are the more beautiful, the more the multitude becomes. So I would, I would say that and on the f second question, I emphatically want to endorse what Diane said. I mean, Schiller had this whole idea that, you know, the improvement of the emotions uh, occurs, especially in the time of leisure. And he says, you have to catch the person at their moments of leisure and that way ennoble them by giving them beautiful art. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, people normally when they work, they are burdened and they don't have time. But, you know, it's exactly the opposite. It's not like letting the sow out, so to speak, you know, when you when you relax and you let it all go. It's the opposite. It is the time where you educate your emotion until the point happens where you blindly can trust them because your emotions will never tell you anything else than what reason commands. And that is exactly the kind of beautiful soul Schiller is talking about. So I fully back what Diane said. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Liliana and then I'll read a couple more questions. Yes. Uh... I uh, fully endorse what Elga said on the first question, and I think I demonstrated it in uh, my uh, presentation on Dante, who puts 
Avicenna, Ibn Sina, a, a great mind of the Arab Renaissance, in the limbo, which means not in hell, together with Socrates and Plato, precisely because he is aware of the importance the Arab Renaissance had to bring, as Helga would say, the beacon of culture from the uh, ancient Greek, from the ancient Indian, to the Arab Renaissance, to Italy and the Italian Renaissance, up to the rest of the world. So it is actually a dialogue of cultures, but at the same time also a dialogue of religions, since this uh, were uh, uh, philosophers, in the case of Ibn Sina, he was also a doctor uh, and a poet himself, uh, uh, a Muslim uh, philosopher. So uh, this is, uh, is not limited to the Judeo-Christian, but it's uh, extended to all cultures and all religions, uh, including Confucius and, uh, and uh, China. Uh, or to the second question, I also endorse fully what Diane said, and I want to remind people again, the example of Dante is significant because in hell, he depicts a horrible, horrible situation with demons, you have sinners, you have people who are in ice uh, stuck because they, they were sinners, like traitors, and uh, uh, the, the paintings of the uh, Inferno, for example, I, I showed one, Dante in the forest, but there are many, uh, including the one I showed of the, of the usurers. They, they seem to be expressing a rage, anger scene, but they express it in a beautiful way. Uh, and this is the key of classical culture. Even when you express tragic, events, even when you express a murder or horrible uh, actions, like the, the killing of the uh, children of Count Ugolino, you express them with beauty, you express them in a beautiful way, and this is the opposite of letting those anger feelings out. It means, as Schiller would say, elevate your emotions out of this anger and fear, into a, 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 a sublime, what Schiller calls the sublime, something which is uh, possible through beauty. The um, I just want to say one thing about that. You know, Liliana, you, you brought up about how the Count Ugolino is a terrible thing, but described in a way that is not um, that is still somehow ennobling. I just want to add that. I had the same experience with the uh, with with the passions with the Bach passions, where as a chorus member you participate in you know shouting insults to Christ, which is hardly a good thing to be doing. Yet somehow Bach does it in a way where it's not purely just an ugly noise. Um, pardon my interjection. Okay, I'd like to pull together two questions now. Um, that are going to be about the concept of a renaissance and what is classical, and then I'm going to turn to uh, education. So the next pair of questions, I'm going to slightly shorten these. Renee asks Helga and others, she says, you have portrayed the magnitude of the crisis strategically and the moral cultural breakdown that obstructs the solution. The horrifying pandemic has shut a huge portion of orchestras, concert halls, choruses around the world. Nothing like this has happened around the world before, except perhaps in the closing days of World War II. But the music culture that has predominated in the transatlantic recently has suffered from the moral crisis that you portray. Can we use this calamitous situation to make an opportunity to restore classical principles as the foundation of what we call music and other forms of art. Is that possible? How can we restore musical culture as part of a global dialogue on the culture um, of mankind? Keep that in your mind. And then I also want to combine that with another question that comes in from Shireen. Shireen asks, she provokes, she says, the image of a renaissance in our minds is sometimes simplified. What really, why really did the people in the past go back to the era of the ancients? 
do we run the risk of adopting a romantic image of intellectuals discovering beautiful ideas from the past? Peter Frankopan, the famous author of the book The Silk Roads, wrote that there were geopolitical reasons for kings and leaders to create a story that Europe was the legitimate center of the world. Some say China is creating an identical geopolitical tale by telling its long history of civilization. Are these hypotheses confronting each other in a new cultural war? And then to summarize one quote from the Peter Frankopan book that Shireen includes, um, Frankopan writes that in reality, neither France nor Germany, Austria, Spain, Portugal, England had anything to do with Athens or the world of the ancient Greeks. As for Rome, it only touched on it. But a veil was thrown over this while a narrative was created that carefully drew in the past to create a story for a present that bases itself on that past. For the first time in history, by creating this story, Europe became the heart of the world. So I uh, put these two concepts before our esteemed panelists uh, to see if Anybody would like to respond on restoring classical culture and on the reality um, of it? So let's go to Dennis and then Helga. No, go to or, Helga, Helga, first. Helga first. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just very briefly, I would like uh, Dave De Broad to pull up the <clears throat> the uh, cover of the new magazine we are putting out in Germany. Uh, this is called Ibicus, uh, which already was uh, published for twenty five years, and now we are republishing it. This is uh, Beethoven, as you can see. And we are also not, not only planning the Leonora magazine, but also Ibicus in German. Uh, it's called uh, Thinking Like Beethoven, and it has all articles by uh, about Beethoven. And r the reason why we republish these magazines is because we are very serious in the intention to create a Renaissance movement. And this is also a direct appeal to you, our viewers, that you should join us because, you know, I mean, okay, some people have said the crisis is such that you need the action from governments to fix it, which in one sense is true. But on the other side, if we don't really create a Renaissance movement of people who reject the degenerate culture, uh, I don't think it will not work and it will be no no guarantee. So I think that the idea of creating a, a Renaissance uh, movement, uh, you know, by consciously going back to all the great periods of the past. And, you know, on the second question by Sherine, I would like to just say, you know, that uh, one characteristics of Renaissance movements was always to go back to the sources that you don't believe a narrative, you know, be it for that reason or that reason, but you always go back to the original thinkers, the original writers, poets, uh, philosophers, and you reconstruct uh, that way universal history as it really was. And it was a, 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 a story of ideas, of principles, like, you know, an ancient idea that there is a unity of truth, the beauty, and the good. Now that is a conception which exists in all great cultures. In that way you find it's like, you know, what Carolina was saying, that you own these ideas and you find out a principle, a method with which you can differentiate if something is true or not. And that is something which Linda LaRouche has provided us as a method of approaching things. So I'm more optimistic about this um, for that reason. Thank you. Dennis. Yeah, well, a um, few things. First of all, <clears throat> let's be clear that um, the reason that this can't be Eurocentric is because cultures and greatness in culture is about the liberation of mankind. All people desire liberation and they use poetry because poetry is the actual beginning or the origin of true ideas. Before people could speak, they sang. So everywhere you have that, 
when you're looking at what people call, for example, Greek civilization, let's remember Plato spent 12 years at the Temple of Ammon and Cyrenaica, Egypt, uh, because of what had happened with Socrates earlier, who also was spent time in Egypt. And the important thing to understand is the interplay between uh, the Temple of Ammon, for example, and what happened in Greece, including the Pythagorean period. Matter of fact, Egypt refounded Greece three times prior to the time of Plato, just as an example. So people, people call Western civilization, Greek civilization. Yes, there was an innovation, a very specific, unique contribution that was made, which changed what had come before. But it's of relevance here because the whole idea of the Schiller Institute and talking about Friedrich Schiller, uh, the greatest of poets, uh, is that he was an intelligence agent. He was also, a, he was an historian. His idea of universal history was exactly that. There's a universal history and it's basically not known. When you're looking at the United States and taking this issue of uh, of trying to describe it, this gets very difficult because of, you know, the things like, uh, you know, some of the, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, right wing, this, this tends to be thought of it that way. You know, the closing of the American mind, Alan Bloom, these kinds of things, and their notion of what they call Western civilization. But Lyndon LaRouche didn't have that idea. It was a completely different idea. And when Helga tried to found, found the Schiller Institute back in 1983, 84, it was a dialogue with American intelligence people to get them to understand that the best way to approach any nation anywhere in the world is to recognize that all nations and all people have this greatness, which is in and the, 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 the fabric of the human soul. It's a matter of finding it. Classical culture is not a form. Classical culture is a very specific intent. And, and, and it's that intent which is missing. And that's what the problem is right now in the transatlantic world. There's no great intent. And people are being dominated by an inferior culture and inferior leadership. That's why they keep getting it. But what they have to do is that's the reason you go back to what go back to the ancients is because you're going forward to a culture of the future. You've got to reject what's around you. You recognize that actually a lot of this is is probably your fault because of the debased character of what you tolerate day after day. And so that's our idea here of of what you do to refound the culture. You fight. And the reason that we used uh, figures, various figures, including emphatically, I wanted to have Malcolm X in there. I wanted to have obviously Dr. King and so on. But Malcolm, because of this idea of fighting and because of the fact that Lyndon LaRouche was like this, right? People didn't like him, but they knew often, despite themselves, that what he was saying was the truth. So I would just say this is the real issue of how we refound the classical culture globally. Good. Would anyone else like to weigh in at this point before I uh, read a couple more questions from our viewers? Okay. So here come the next couple. And then I'm also, uh, before I turn it back to our panel, I'm going to um, announce again the, the phone number that you can call in uh, to become a member of the Schiller Institute or if you have questions that you'd like to discuss with somebody here. So this is a question on education that comes from Suzanne with the LaRouche Organization. Suzanne says that some years ago, the Schiller Institute encouraged recitation competitions among young students, emphasizing the importance of memorization and the ability to communicate the ideas of another. In his presentation today, Dennis Speed mentioned the Book of Speeches prized by students in the U.S. in the 19th century, including Frederick Douglass. Dikran Tulane, a Shakespearean actor, has also discussed the importance of such exercises of memorization and communication among adults and children, and has discussed this activity, seemingly restricted only to uh, actors and actresses, as an antidote against the violence which has developed among young people in modern education. Would you discuss the importance of including the study of oratory, memorization, recitation of poetry, and drama in public schools? Would the Schiller Institute revive its outreach activity to students with such competitions in the future? How can this play a role uh, in education? So this is, uh, let's, let's go with that, see if anybody has any responses. Dennis, it seems like that one's kind of directed to you. Uh, and I'd also like to hear from Carolina uh, on this one as it addresses education, which is the topic that she took up. Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to throw that question to Helga because, because 
for two reasons. First of all, because the um, identification of, Lin of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address as probably the greatest American poem, the first person I ever heard say that was Helga. And I think that's useful to think about the issue of recitation. You know, when we grew up, uh, certainly back in the 1960s, everybody was required to know that. And then Dr. King's speech uh, from 1963 was another addition to this. And people just knew these things. Um, so I'll, I'll refer that because also the competition is how it started. So why don't we go to you? Oh, Carolina wanted to say something. Oh, I thought you were going to. Okay, sorry. And, and Carolina, um, can I remind, we don't have, the, the translation is consecutive, not simultaneous. So please keep that in mind as you respond. Lina. Sí. ¿Me escucha? Yes. Can you hear, you hear me? me? Eh, antes que nada, quisiera aprovechar este momento para pedir una disculpa a la gente que habla español porque la conferencia no se escuchó en español, pero se escuchó bien en inglés. Before, before anything else, I would like to apologize to those who are listening in Spanish because my presentation for technical reasons couldn't be heard in Spanish, although it was heard in English. Um, solo quiero mencionar que el trabajo que estamos haciendo sobre la educación de los jóvenes en las universidades es parte del legado de Lyndon LaRouche y sobre todo el, como mencionó Helga, ir a los autores originales. El que... I would just like to mention, I would just like to mention uh, mm -hmm. that the, in terms of the work that we're carrying out on education with the youth at the universities, this is part of the legacy of Lyndon LaRouche. In particular, as Helga was saying, returning to the original authors. Eso te da fuerza, te da fuerza, te da un criterio propio que te permite eh, identificar lo que es correcto en la política y en tu vida personal. That's what gives you strength. It allows you to form your own judgment. Uh, it gives you enough of a sense of identity to be able to identify and know what is correct in your personal life and politically. Y yo creo que si la poesía y el arte clásico se diera como... En la educación básica, podríamos tener mejores ciudadanos. And I believe that if po poetry and classical art were uh, taught as part of basic education, we would have better citizens. Y quisiera, me, me han llegado mensajes de jóvenes de Iberoamérica felicitando por la revista Leonora e Iricos, y hay mucha emoción de poder empezar a leerlas y circularlas también aquí. And I've received a number of messages from youth around Ibero-America congratulating people on the uh, upcoming publication of Leonora and Ibicus, and we're really interested in being able to read those here as well. Eso es todo. Gracias. That's all for now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carolina. Megan, go right ahead. Just a quick thing on memorization. I, I don't have much experience with memorization of drama and poetry, but more I have experience with memorization of music, which you almost can't help but memorize. And one quick thing I wanted to add is, I think with music, people have this idea that they can have two separate lives. You know, I have my, what Helga was bringing up about, you know, when you relax, you let out the, you know, you kind of let loose and you let out your wild side, but that that doesn't affect the other part of your life. It's just not true. And I think you discover that negatively in the popular culture, but you also discover it positively with beautiful culture in that when you start to learn some of these beautiful German Lieder, um, the, the choral piece that Jason was bringing up, the choral piece that our chorus is working on, the Beethoven Misa Solemnis, it becomes part of you. And it acts upon you even when you're not conscious, you know, or directly working on it. it. It shapes the way you think. And I remember many conversations with Lyndon LaRouche where he would discuss the compositional method of Bach and Bach's followers and being able to develop in a powerful way the method of generating ironies which necessitate a solution the exact same way as a great scientific mind 
is able to generate ironies in investigation of the physical world. And so I think that participating in beautiful classical culture, it permanently changes you and changes your mind. So in terms of its value for young students, I think it might be the most important thing and should probably be the first thing that we teach them. And then just one very quick thing in um, regards to the second question you asked about, uh, again, going back to, you know, like a, a, a classical culture, but then also a culture of, emo or a, you know, songs of emotion or something. I think people also have an idea that classical culture is very straight laced and stiff, but <laughs> some of the, the most beautiful songs and leader and poems are very, very funny. So I would just encourage everybody to get to know them more. Great. So let me, uh, uh, yes, Liliana, and then um, then I'm going to do, actually, Liliana, I hate to do this, but let me let me read the last two questions that we're going to take on this and then ask everybody to have one final chance to offer their thoughts, and then we're going to have to bring this one to a close. I also do want to acknowledge the, uh, the questions that have come in that we've not been able to take in this panel, including from Uganda, from Jamaica, um, about the uh, Harris-Biden administration. Um, these will be forwarded to the the next panel where they actually, they may be a little bit more um, able to be brought in. If you'd like to get in touch with us by phone right now, call us 917-475-8828. We are eager to get your call um, to talk to you about the activities of the Schiller Institute, how you can participate in that with us, become a sustaining member, and uh, you'll be a subscriber to the Leonora magazine that we heard about from Anastasia Battle. Again, the number 917 Four seven five eight eight two eight. If you don't reach us in person right now, leave a message. We will get back to you. So, I'd like to now read uh, the last two questions that we're going to be able to take on this panel and ask everybody to uh, respond to them and offer whatever thoughts they'd like to add to this uh, this discussion. The first question comes from Emma uh, from the Larouche organization in Detroit, and she has a reflection about uh, Bach. Emma says, "I have often thought." that Bach's Es ist vollbracht and the story of Christ is a perfect example of the coincidence of opposites, the reconciliation of Christ's suffering and his victory. Perhaps Helga, Diane, or anyone else would like to say more about that. The second question, which I'm going to kind of shoehorn together here, um, is about the reconciliation between the individual and society. The question is, if heteronymous things, such as nation states, are considered politically sovereign, why aren't autonomous things, such as human beings, politically sovereign? In other words, if government is to be truly of the people, by the people, and for the people, then shouldn't an individual have the contractedly inalienable right, after grave deliberation and in response to a long train of abuses, to personally secede from his or her nation state and establish his own nation state. So you can you can take the concept behind that question and uh, and Emma's about uh, about es ist vollbracht. And um, okay, let's go to our panel here. So who's who's first to take this one up? Megan, why don't you let us know what you think about this and any other concluding thoughts that you've got? Sure. Well, on the on the second one, I can take a stab at it. Um, it's not surprising that people are uh, pessimistic and disillusioned with the ability of their governments to represent their well-being, given the recent long train of abuses. But I think the hypothesis of the American Republic, which was really the hypothesis going all the way back to the Renaissance, um, is that there is inherently no contradiction between the action of a sovereign government of the people, a republic, as we you know, took a stab at embodying that in the American constitution, um, that there's no contradiction between that and the well-being, not just of the people today, but the most important group of people are our posterity. Um, and I mean, really, when you consider how it were possible to allow each living person to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people possible, which is those people to come, the only way to do that is to organize ourselves through sovereign governments. 
um, especially when you start to think about the goodness that we can do, not just for people, but for the universe at large through space exploration and colonization. And I would challenge any individual autonomous person to uh, build their own space program and then, <laughs> then maybe you would reconsider the importance of governments. <laughs> yes. Boy, you can't even make your own, you know, online chat platform, you know. All right, uh, Dennis. Yeah, well, I would say that actually the answer to the second question is in considering the first. And here's why. Beethoven composed the uh, Opus 110 in the year 1821. And when he dedicated it, he dedicated it on Christmas Day. Um, and um, of course, he was completely deaf at the time he wrote the Sonata. Uh, and the last movement, uh, which is this recitative and aria setup, it's all vocal. Uh, it's only incidentally on the piano. And it's on the piano because of the multiplic multiplicity of voices. But what he's dealing with is death and resurrection. It's very specific in the sonata because the sonata has this uh, this aria, which is very, uh, uh, which is the S is very from 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 Bach. He's 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 talking about it, and then he has a fugue, and then he goes back again, and it's even more deeply agonizing. And then there's a second fugue, which is an inverse of the first. Um, and, and the importance of this uh, approach that Beethoven takes is it is so free in terms of what you hear. It is so much like it actually sounds a bit like a I always thought about it in terms of the marches of not merely the civil rights movement, not merely Gandhi's movement, but this idea of constantly moving forward, no matter what may seem to be the infirmities or the indignities or the suffering or the inevitable circumstances of your own life. He was completely deaf when he wrote it, um, but uh, you have no sense of that kind of um, uh, being overcome by pain. It has nothing but victory about it. And in that respect, again, it's very much like what you find in the spirituals. There's always a sense of victory. It's not a sense of rage. There's a sense of victory. And of course, often that has to be religious. And that's why they are religious. And that's also why the box setting by Beethoven is particularly appropriate. And that's the real uh, answer to this issue of the sovereignty of the individual. That's how you find your sovereignty. Great. Let's turn next to uh, Liliana, who I know had wanted to respond to the previous question too, and then Carolina. Liliana? Yes, uh, I wanted to respond to the question about recitation and memorization because in Italy, when I went to school, it was mandatory to memorize and recite by heart Dante's Commedia, something which was uh, abolished when the reform, the school reform started, which was inspired by the Frankfurt School or similar to the Brandt reform, and they uh, explicitly and they were disturbed by Dante, which is significant. And I think it shows that the Great Reset is also, there is also a cultural Great Reset. They are trying to destroy our culture. And uh, also answering to René's question on orchestras being shut down, uh, theaters never being open, while uh, uh, sports, uh, football was going on in Italy and other countries, we had uh, no time in which theaters or concerts were again possible. And uh, this is part of the Great Reset. They, they, this has nothing to do with the pandemics. And we had demonstrations of artists and musicians in uh, Rome and other cities to demand that the uh, theaters and operas are opened again, because if this and schools are closed, we will lose this culture. And I think recitation uh, and memorization is part of it. So I would encourage people, young people, to try. I tried myself. I, I looked at the Gassman, Vittorio Gassman, a great classical actor who recited the whole Commedia by heart. Uh, and uh, and it's, I discovered in, in uh, listening to him how hard it is to recite Dante's Commedia but it is an important effort. It's an important effort because as Megan was saying, it does transform you. 
Thank you. Carolina? Gracias. Yo quiero mencionar que por eso estamos trabajando a Schiller dentro del movimiento de jóvenes. Él dice que todo progreso en lo político viene de un ennoblecimiento del carácter. No es posible de otra forma. I want to I want to uh, mention that that's exactly why we're studying Schiller in the work that we're doing with youth in the Schiller Institute because he says that uh, no political progress is possible without ennobling the soul and the character. Por eso es que hicimos la carta abierta la rush en las universidades como ejemplo de verdadero agape. That's why we did the open letter of la rush at the in the universities. Uh, Uh, as an example of true agape, what is uh, truth really? Queremos que todos puedan revisar la carta, firmarla, dejarnos sus datos para contactarnos con ustedes. We all want you to uh, read the entire document, this entire open letter, to sign it, to join it, and to leave us your information so that we can get in contact with you. Porque cada, cada, cada joven estudiante y cada persona tiene el derecho de desarrollar su potencial. Because every youth, every student has the right to fully develop his or her potential. Pero ¿cómo lo puedes desarrollar si no te confrontas con absolutamente nada de lo que está ocurriendo? Uh, but how can you possibly develop that if you don't face anything at all about what is currently going on in the world? Estamos creando una nueva dinámica en la forma de educación. We are creating a new dynamic in the form of education. Que te puedes conocer a ti mismo por medio de estudiar la mente de otros. That you can get to know yourself by studying the minds of others. Y que eso te da libertad. And it is that which gives you freedom. Y cuando logras transmitir eso a la mente y el alma de otra persona. And when you're able to transmit that to the mind and the soul of another person. Sientes felicidad. You feel happiness. Es como cuando lees a Sócrates de la caverna de Platón. It's like when you read what Socrates says in Plato's cave. Si no regresas a decirles lo que hay afuera y simplemente te quedas afuera, eso no te da felicidad. If you don't go back to tell people what is actually going on outside and you just stay outside yourself, that does not lead to happiness. Así que invito a unirse a esta campaña y que podamos hacer este proceso entre todos. So I invite you all to join this campaign and that we can carry out this process together. Thank you, Carolina. So let's turn now to um, Diane, and then we'll give the uh, final word to Helga Tsepp LaRouche. The last two questions again, just to remind, not that you have to respond to them directly, were is about Bach's Es ist vollbracht, as the reconciliation of Christ's suffering with his victory, and about the contrast between the sovereignty of a nation state and sovereignty from the standpoint um, of an individual. So Diane, on that, and anything else about the panel? Sure. Uh, I think it, yes, I mean, this question, as Emma says, the coincidence of opposites or a, a paradox. And Schiller takes us up in at least a couple places, many places, Helga would know better, but why we delight in tragic subjects and the on the sublime, where um, the kind of happiness um, comes not as something glib, but as a victory over um, over something less lesser, I'll put it that way, like our physical nature, when you do something that goes against what would be quote unquote natural, a uh, fight or flight reflex or something like that. Um, and this gets to really the question of the immortality of mankind because as much as we may not consider it all the time and probably not as much as we should, each one of us is going to die at some point. And, but we would hope 
that mankind as a whole is immortal, which is why it's so urgently necessary that we get to other planets, at least sometime in the next billion years or so, and hopefully sooner. Um, and therefore, and sometimes it requires a sacrifice of one's life, not that one goes out and says, oh, I'm going to die for this, but you say there's a higher principle, which is the immortality of mankind than my life. And that's, um, you know, I think it comes up in this Gethsemane question because you say, well, if God is all powerful, um, what's the point of Christ? It's already ordained. Christ already said it. He's going to be crucified. It's been known that this is to happen. So why is it necessary that Christ has this moment of profound anguish, knowing what's in store for him, and then has to make the decision to drink of the cup into his own act. And it's only by making this necessary death into his own decision that he is liberated in the same way that Martin Luther King said in the mountaintop speech that uh, longevity has its place, but I'm not worried about that now. Uh, it's a personal decision and and it has a resonance in all human beings when you witness that, um, the so-called experience of tears of joy, which you would also think is paradoxical because you get a profound joy in uh, witnessing or being part of someone overcoming the mere physical necessity, seeming physical necessity to um, something greater. And I would say that the that capacity abides in every single living human being. Um, and it's a question of how to access it and how people can be conscious of it, uh, which is going to be urgently necessary to resolve these crises. Great. So let's turn to Helga Sepp LaRouche to conclude this panel. Well, first of all, I want to say that the Ibicus is also going to be available in a printed form, not only electronically. And when you join the Schiller Institute, you can uh, have a copy of that also on a regular basis, which I really think is, is very important. On Emma's question, um, on the concept of the co committee of, of, of the coincidence of opposites, this is not a static concept, but it is like a, you know, a contrapuntal fugal development where the opposites, in a certain sense, reach into each other, furthering their own developments. And that way it becomes a dynamic process of self-perfection. And I think that that is really the same answer like to this question of how do you overcome the contradiction between the state and the individual, where Schiller in the aesthetical letter basically says, you know, the, the great task of the individual is to become identical with the ideal state. Now, how should that occur? Obviously not by the state suppressing the rights of the individuals, but that the um, activity and the development of the individual makes the state. So, you know, in a certain sense, the state citizen is what will make the quality of such an ideal state. Now, that is really the question of a dynamic development and change, and the change is an improvement, uh, which is the law of the universe. So the more you attune with the lawfulness of the universe by self-improvement, by self-development, by taking respons responsibility for the common good, you become like what is the state. And I think that that is a, a dynamic concept which people should um, should assimilate. Wonderful. So that will uh, will draw this panel to a close then. I'd like to thank Helga Sepp LaRouche, Diane Sayre, Liliana Garini, Dennis Speed, Megan DeBrote, Carolina Dominguez, and the many musical and cultural performers who helped uh, bring their presentations to life. I'd like to thank the 
questioners, including those that we weren't able to get to. And I'd like to urge everyone to come right back very soon to the second panel of our conference, which is going to be starting in about uh, half an hour. It'll begin at 2 o'clock Eastern, 11 Pacific, 7 o'clock Central European time. If you would like to be in touch with us during that break, or in general, this, this number is not just for people watching it live, call the Schiller Institute, 917-475-8828. We would be very eager to have you become a member of the Schiller Institute and support the uh, crucially important work that we perform. So that'll end panel one. See you very soon for the strategic crisis facing the human race, which is the second panel with a truly phenomenal array of speakers, including representatives of China, Russia, Syria, and a former member of the U.S. National Security Council. See you soon.